Uh, next up is Eric. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is uh, Eric. Yeah, sometimes I forget, sorry. Um, I've been working in New Zealand at Plantain Food Research now for the past four years. And I found it to be quite different from some of the other jobs that I had before. I used to work for companies like Hewlett Packard and IBM, who happen to be the Ember sponsors of the conference, so that pleases me. Um, but working in plant and food has taught me uh, some of the challenges that scientists actually have nowadays. A few of those are IT related. And today I wanted to share those with you. It's going to be a different talk because I'm not going to be teaching you anything. I'm a very lousy teacher, so don't ask me questions. <laughs> but I wanted to share some of the issues that scientists currently have with using IT to solve their problems. And who knows, maybe someone has ideas on how to solve them. Now, the main goal of our company is to do research, but not just any research, scientific research. And this means that it needs to be reproducible. The notion behind reproducible research is fundamental to the scientific method. It's this idea that everything you do, every experiment, every result, needs to always be the same, no matter how many times you do it or who is doing it. And we basically are governed by this principle in everything we do. It's, I wanted to make an emphasis on this concept because it's so central to how we do things that it affects pretty much everything. That includes the role, the environment that I manage, and also the issues that we face. So let's have a look at those. Because the main goal of the company is to do science, money is somewhat of a secondary concern for us. I know you laugh, but in practice what this means is that I'm not going to be too worried if the systems are down. Because we're not really losing money from customers not being able to throw the credit card details at us. Yes, you still need to pay the scientists who's just sitting there, not doing much, which is pretty much what they do anyway. But <laughs> no, I'm kidding. They're really hardworking people. But I'm going to be more concerned about keeping the system running for as long as possible without it crashing or without rebooting, keeping the uptime numbers very high, rather than bringing the system back up quickly if something goes down. And this is slightly different from the notion of zero downtime because that assumes that you have multiple instances of the same thing. And if one of them goes down, you have the other ones you can do low balancing. That doesn't really work in our environment. And you'll see later why. The other aspect of it is that you really need to have an understanding of some of the tools that the scientists are running in your environment. So this goes beyond just how to compile them or how to install them. You also need to know how they perform in the IT architecture that they're running on. And this means that in my role, you can go pretty quickly from changing make files or running the configure to drawing pretty pictures on BCO. And this is something that other companies typically separate into different roles, probably done by different people. The consequence of concentrating that into just a few people in my team means that you need to have knowledge of many different layers of technology and how they interact with each other. So you sort of become a one-man band. Big companies like to separate these roles into multiple teams. So a sysadmin will typically deal with just the operating system. And then you have other teams dedicated to the storage, the network, or the backup and data retention policies. In my company, it's somewhat different. We do still have a somewhat large team, large, 10 people. But we need to know pretty much a little bit of everything. Um, the cool thing about it, though, is because we do everything, I put the IT architecture together of the stuff that I again need to support. Actually, that's not too good, because if something breaks in, it's my fault. OK, anyway, anyway, let's keep moving on and talk about the environment that I keep mentioning. I put it together, so I'm very proud of it. And I could go on for hours and hours about what makes it unique or what makes it interesting. But today, I'm going to be focusing on just these few things. Now, can anyone tell me, what would you do if your monitoring tool, whatever that is, shows you this graph? If you cannot see very well, what this graph is showing is the memory usage on one of our servers. The red area over there is obviously the used memory. And this is over a seven-day period. So what will you do if you see your monitoring tool showing you something like this? You probably want to log into the server, do a top, figure out what process is causing it, and maybe even shoot the bastard. 
Well, not in my environment. We actually like it when our servers are doing this because it means that we spend our money well. You may not have noticed in the previous slide, and I blame the beautiful contrasting colors that my monitor tool gives me, but that server actually has two terabytes of RAM memory. And we have two servers like that one. We also have a collection of some other different smaller servers, and we put all of these in a bag and we call it a cluster. But the reason for this variety is that the tools that we run really have different requirements. Some of them need a lot of memory, and some of them need more CPU cores. Some of them actually need a little bit of both. So I keep talking about the tools and how they somewhat shape the environment that they're running on. And you may be now wondering, what kind of tools are we running? Well, we do plant biology, plant research. So our users are mainly doing bioinformatics. And if you've been to the bioinformatics mini conference yesterday, you will know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I don't really know much, but I know that it deals with finding information in genomic sequences. So the tools that we run are varied. Lots of specialized software. They will be doing many wonderful things, probably implementing some sort of complex algorithm to search and mine for information. I don't know, you have gene finding tools, genome browsers, sequence alignment tools, um, many wonderful things. But there's tons of tools like this one. And we need to pretty much support every single one of them. We need to make sure that all of them run. And this leads us to having to customize our environment quite a lot. So I mentioned that we have quite a few different servers and to make sure that we automate the distribution of resources of those servers amongst our users. We put job schedulers in place, not the new high-P ones like um, Mesos or Zookeeper. We, I'm talking about the old ones, the platform LSF or SunGrid engine. Uh, in our case, we're using OpenLava, a fork of LSF. And these tools are very peculiar because in order to install them and configure them, you need to do a lot of manual work. I mean, the OpenLava installation procedure literally says install it in the master and then copy the files to the nodes. So it's quite a manual process. It doesn't end there. Some of the tools are very, very smart about what they're doing, but not too smart about how they do it. So we need to figure out what may cause them to break them, like trying to write temporary files to where it was installed, and hack our way around them to make sure that it doesn't break anything else. And I could go on, but I'm sure that most of you will be mainly interested about what are the issues that cause me to bang my head against the desk every day. <laughs> because, you know, that's what makes being a CSAM fun, right? So let's have a look at that. The same, exactly the same. We're not the only company that has been hit by the issue of big data. Yes, I said it or data, if you prefer it like that. We have seen the size of our storage grow. You cannot really make up the numbers there, but in the past two years, we went from 90 terabytes to the over 200 and something that we have now. But we have not also seen the use base going up. We have also seen the, si the size of the files going up as well. Big data is not really a problem. I mean, it's an easy problem to fix. You just buy more storage. The problem for us is that with bigger size of files, we need bigger servers to analyze them. And this is the graph of the same process than before, now over an eight-day period, which is how long the process took to finish, on that two terabyte server that I was telling you about. So you can see it's been maxed out pretty much the entire time. Now, what I didn't tell you earlier is that this is just one user running one job, one process. It's a multi-threaded process, but still one. And we have hundreds of users. So if one of these processes takes eight days to finish, or more in a few cases, how are we managing having multiple users wanting to do the same thing? It's probably insane. Funny fact, though, these two servers, the two terabyte ones that I uh, mentioned, can actually be physically plugged in together on the back with some magic cables. And you can boot them up as a single big four terabyte server. And one of our scientists has actually asked us that we do this for him next month. Uh, because of a project that he's going to be working on, and he knows that two terabytes is not going to be enough. So now I need to go and look for um, those bloody cables. Um, but now you may be wondering, how is this a smart way of doing things? Why? Why are you doing this? Why can't you just, you know, chunk up the job and run it in multiple servers? Well, I wondered the same thing, and I was looking for an authoritative answer to this question. 
I couldn't find any, but I found this quote in a forum that was discussing the current state of bioinformatics tools. Now, I don't know this guy, Bill. I don't know if he's an expert in this sort of thing, but this is 2015. Yes, you should be moving to distributed parallel computing many years ago. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you don't see all of the stuff that's in there. It's just a bunch of tools that we have installed. I was going to go into the details of all the pain and suffering that maintaining this represents. But then I realized that I could say myself about 20 minutes um, and summarize it in two words. So who here has to manually compile different pieces of software every day for their job? A few hands. And who many of you really, really enjoy doing it? No one? Come on, what are you doing working in IT then? The problem with distributing all of these tools is that there is no standard to distribute them, let alone how to install them. So mandatory famous comic slide. We fall into this trap quite often. Every single time that we have to customize our environment to allow a tool to run on it, or we have to change a tool, the source code of it, to let it run in our environment, we are deviating from what any other institution may be doing. And this is a problem for science. Let's leave alone the issue of not even being able to figure out how to use the cloud uh, right now. We cannot even collaborate with other institutions that are wanting to do work with us. I mean, most of our scientists are not really concerned about learning the command line or the different and many parameters that different job schedulers have around the world. We have one, but all the places may have a different one. So how can we talk about collaboration when the sysadmin on the other side of the world will be doing things differently than what we're trying to do? If you think about all of these issues from the point of view of a scientist that just wants to have his research peer reviewed by his colleagues and publish this information so that other people can corroborate the results, you start to realize that there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the process. From the moment a research project project gets funded until the moment the results are published, a long time can go by, and many things can change in the middle. What if the operating system in your cluster has changed, or the version of the software tool that you're running has evolved or changed to a different one? And what if the libraries that that tool was compiled against dynamically has also, have also changed? This can give you, in effect, a different result, and it has happened, particularly with our packages, um, which are for statistical analysis. So, what is the solution? Can anyone tell me what is the IT industry standard answer to any problem in existence over the past, let's say, two or three years? China. Yes, you put it in a container. <laughs> of course, it makes sense, right? I mean, containers are small, they're lightweight, they're portable, and the images are immutable until you rebuild them again. But containers are not yet ready for how we want to use them, I think. I mean, we're still waiting for things like user namespaces so that we can control the ownership of our data. And what happens if two different users or more are trying to run different jobs on the same host when they can kill each other's processes? Uh, no questions asked. The main aspect for me, though, is that I don't really want to keep giving root powers to people that don't really care about learning the command line. So they're not really a solution just yet. They may be in the future if we keep working on them, but we cannot really adopt them as they are. We are exploring other different things, like background images or VM images up in the cloud, but ultimately they're still very heavy in the res um, resource requirements that they have. So we're still trying to figure out an answer. So if you have any ideas, please come talk to me. That's where you can find them in. And otherwise, it's question time. Thank you. Yes? Right. So the question is, how do we approach the problem of the data and the metadata? If you don't really know what metadata is talking about, is understanding when you have a file that just has ACTGs on it, 
what is actually the data, because the file name may not just be enough. You need to record the information about what species that sequence file is, um, where it was collected, all, all the information about how the file actually came to be. Um, we are exploring tools like IROTS, which comes from the uh, CERN Institute, it's a metadata management tool. We haven't fully deployed it into production yet because we need to figure out how we want to use them, but yeah, that's one of the tools that we're exploring for that. Any other questions? Yes? When you have two terabytes of RAM, you're going to start seeing uncorrectable errors in it very frequently, I would have thought. How do you deal with them? Can you repeat what you will start seeing? When you have large amounts of RAM, like two terabytes or a half, you're going to start seeing uncorrectable errors in it because you know, the bit error rate is fairly high compared with yeah. If you start seeing, the question is, if you start seeing, when you have two terabytes of RAM, you start seeing uncorrectable errors in what you're doing, simply because of, of the large amount of memory. Well, the thing is, we don't know when an error actually happens. If the tool that the scientist is running is smart enough to detect that something like that has happened, memory corruption happened, then hopefully they will get um, a warning or an error on the console. Whether that happens or not, Pardon? Linux will log it. Not for that. Yep. Linux will log an ECC error, a memory error. Luckily, that hasn't happened to us. So Linux will obviously log the tool if that actually happens. That hasn't happened for us just yet. So we're, I suppose we can call ourselves lucky. But it is a problem because, yeah, if you get an error and that error is silent or the user doesn't know about it, then if a job takes weeks or months to finish, how many times do you think a scientist is going to want to rerun it to verify the result? Right. We don't really have a way to validate that, no. Unless the tool actually provides that sort of self-control, I'm not going to be talking to the uh, scientists and say, hey, this job has failed for you because of this or that, unless they come and ask me, hey, my results are not looking right. Can you figure out why? Oh, no. Yes. Um, my, yeah. Yep. Um, if Andrew's here, can he pop up and start setting up? And um, we've got time for a few more questions. And we can talk about that after. Yeah. Um, can you repeat, repeat them back if they're short, if they're long questions, probably wait and talk to them afterwards. Okay. Yes. I'd like to ask another question. As I come from the research end, we use a lot of softwares. And uh, it's not a question, I just want you to share your experience if you have any, that changing your computer or changing your server sometimes doesn't give you the reproducible results. Have you, felt, have you came across such situation when you're running one software on a big server and you change your software and the results of that science or the project comes out a little bit different in numbers? Have you got some sort of such situation in your research? So have I ever come across of a specific case where changing the servers gives me a different result running the same tool against the same data? Me personally, no, because I don't run them. My scientists may have. Um, I know that it has happened, and there is literature about it, where changing the, la the version of one package may cause to give you different results. And the package is based on some math library. And math, as we know, is supposed to be always the same. 2 plus 2 is 4 all the time, I think. Um, but it, it, it has happened before, and it's been documented that small changes in the versions may lead to different results or inconsistent results. Anybody else? Cool. Right. Well, if, if you have any ideas again, please come talk to me. And otherwise, thank you so much.